My name is Jerome Payne. I'm the Regulation Exams Manager here at Fitch Learning. Um, I deliver and write courses to do with regulations, financial crime, but also other courses to do with securities, derivatives, taxation, um, investment and wealth management. I also do various management and professional development programs too. Regulations can be quite a dry subject and by interacting with the materials rather than simply reading it, it helps you get a deeper understanding of the topics being covered. So there'll be a little bit of group work and, and I'll be throwing out a few questions to the class. Um, we're all friends in the room, we're all friends together, therefore please do feel free to be open and, and contribute as much as you can to the class. The more you contribute then the more interesting, exciting and memorable this will be for, for you guys. So the first kind of the key theme that I wanted to talk about with you is an overview of the different regulators that exist within the United Kingdom, the way they fit together and the way in which they operate. This allows us to see the relationships between these different regulators as well as talking about the main role that these regulators play in the UK financial services industry. So we're going to take a look at the UK regime. The two main regulators in the United Kingdom are the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, and the Prudential Regulation Authority, the PRA. Now these regulators were created under something called the Financial Services Act of 2012, okay, which created these regulators in uh, April 2013, which was last year. So let's take a closer look at these regulators. So the first one we're going to mention is the Financial Conduct Authority. Let me ask you, um, fr from your um, experience in the financial services industry, what, what do you think the role is of the Financial Conduct Authority? What do you think they spend their time doing? One of the key roles that the Financial Conduct Authority deploys is making sure that customers are treated properly, treated fairly, to use the regulator's description. Okay, treating customers fairly is one of the key roles that any firm is expected to carry out in the marketplace. And the Financial Conduct Authority will look into the conduct of firms, the way you conduct yourself in your interactions with your customers and with your clients. Excellent. So dealing with clients and customer interactions is one of the key roles which the FCA would carry out. But is that all? Is there, is there anything else do you think that the FCA gets involved in? Okay, conduct the business rules. Excellent. Conduct the business rules govern client interactions. And the FCA will monitor to see whether or not firms are following the conduct of business rules. They define the rules, they interpret the rules, they also give guidance to firms on how they should interpret the rules. The regulators are not some kind of draconian body simply there to punish you when things go wrong. The regulators want to work together with participants and firms in the financial services industry to cooperate together so as to gain mutually beneficial outcomes, both for the regulator and for firms. But there's no point having rules unless you're going to enforce those rules, is there? Unless you're going to employ people to watch out for firms and individuals who choose to break the rules, and unless you have some kind of enforcement process which allows the regulator to determine how the punishment or, or remedy for breaking those rules ought to take place. So the Financial Conduct Authority employs something called the Regulatory Decisions Committee, the RDC, okay, which is a subdivision of the FCA. The Regulatory Decisions Committee considers cases where firms or individuals are alleged to have broken rules, whether that's kind of the business rules or, or any other type of rules which the FCA supervises. And the FCA's Regulatory Decisions Committee decides whether or not those people should be punished and if so, to what extent. Any other things the FCA does, do you think? The FCA is also there to help to ensure the integrity of the UK financial system is preserved. Integrity in the sense of making people believe that the UK financial services industry is well regulated, making them believe that it's a safe place in which they can invest their funds, in which they can do business. So one of the key roles that the FCA plays is in helping to reduce financial crime in the UK financial services industry. They oversee, for example, the insider dealing legislation. They oversee the market abuse regime. They also interact with law enforcement agencies when it comes to combating other types of financial crime, such as money laundering, financing of terrorism, corruption, bribery, etc. Okay, so helping to preserve the UK financial system's integrity is one of the key roles that the Financial Conduct Authority would get involved in. And the, the, the areas that I've decided that, that we're going to kind of talk about in class start off with a look at the regulators, 
We'll also look at the FCA's principles for businesses, which, which are all about fair play for clients and making sure that clients and customers are handled in the right manner. And then we'll finish off with a look at some examples of how the FCA gets involved in helping to combat financial crime. That's the kind of structure of today's course. Okay, so the FCA, one of the key regulators there. The, the FCA is an independent regulator. It's a company. It's not a government department. It's a company. It's a standalone company. If you work for the FCA, you're not a civil servant. You're an employee of the FCA. However, unlike other companies, the FCA doesn't have shareholders. Instead, the FCA's liabilities are directly guaranteed by the UK government. The FCA is accountable to Her Majesty's Treasury. On an annual basis, the chairman of the FCA will write a report to the Chancellor describing to what extent the FCA has discharged its statutory objectives. These are the roles which the law says the FCA must carry out. We'll look at those in a moment. The Chancellor then uh, presents that report to Parliament. And this gives democratic accountability and democratic control over the actions of the FCA. Unlike the FCA, the PRA, the Prudential Regulation Authority, is not an independent standalone regulator. It's not a separate company. Okay? The PRA was the part of the old Financial Services Authority which was taken away okay, under the Financial Services Act 2012 and given to the Bank of England. The PRA is a subsidiary of the Bank of England. It's controlled by the Bank of England. If you're in the PRA, then you're a Bank of England employee. All make sense? And the rump of the old FSA became what is now the Financial Conduct Authority. Okay, the, the vast majority of employees and tasks and roles and so on were transferred across to the FCA. So the PRA, Bank of England subsidiary. The Financial Services Act created something called the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England, the FPC Committee. Um, back in 1997, the Bank of England was given control over interest rates with something called the Monetary Policy Committee. And the government was impressed and pleased with the way in which the Monetary Policy Committee worked. So they decided to, to copy this, to mimic this, by creating the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England. The FPC meets four times a year. And their job is to try and ensure the stability of the UK financial services industry and the UK economy more generally. The government got quite a nasty scare, to say the least, back in 2008, when it looked as if various banks were going to collapse and it looked as if the stability of the UK financial system was going to be torn asunder. That ended up with nationalisation of various different UK banks and institutions and it, we all know the rest of the story from that point onwards. The FPC's job is to try and ensure that doesn't happen again. So the FPC gives directions and commands to the PRA and the FCA in order to try and ensure that that kind of thing doesn't happen again. Okay, so where do firms fit into this? Well, broadly speaking, there are two categories of firms. Okay, these are regulated firms, firms authorised and regulated under the Financial Services Markets Act 2000 to carry out regulated activities in or into the UK. The first category of firms to be aware of are the so-called dual regulated firms. As the name suggests, dual regulated means that both of these two regulators authorise, supervise and control the activities of these firms. So which are these dual regulated firms? These are all deposit-taking institutions. So that means banks, of course. It also means building societies. It includes things like credit unions, okay, anywhere it's possible for you to place funds on deposit. Secondly, it involves all insurance companies. So we're thinking of both life insurance companies and investment type insurance companies, but also general insurance companies too, the whole of the insurance industry. Thirdly, it contains what the Financial Services Act calls significant investment firms. Okay, significant investment firms are those other authorised firms who are not deposit takers or insurance companies, yet who are large enough to pose a risk to the stability of the UK financial services industry. So the biggest fund management firms, for example, the, the, the biggest stockbrokers, right? The ones which, if they were to collapse, would undermine the stability of the system. So those three groups of firms are dual regulated. You may have heard the expression Twin Peaks regulatory regime. This doesn't refer to some crummy early 90s BBC2 docudrama. It, it refers... Sorry. 
to a, to a wonderful piece of entertainment which all students at A-level media studies should be forced to study. Sorry, sorry I got that wrong. It, it refers to the fact that some firms are dual regulated. They, they have a Twin Peaks regime of regulation. So for these firms, the Prudential Regulation Authority regulates the prudential standards and their prudential activities. Things such as ensuring that they are adequately capitalised, for example, making sure that they follow BAL rules, such as BAL 2, BAL 3, um, Solvency 2 regulations for insurance companies, that, that, that kind of thing. Whereas the Financial Conduct Authority regulates the conduct of these firms, the way that these firms conduct themselves with clients, conduct themselves with one another. Okay? Now, of the 33,000, roughly speaking, regulated firms in the UK, approximately 3,000 fall into this category. The other 30,000 are single regulated firms. They're regulated solely by the Financial Conduct Authority, both for their prudential and for their conduct-based activities. Okay, so you can see how the diagram kind of fits all of this together. These are much smaller firms, the firms which, if they were to collapse, that would not pose any significant threat to the stability of the UK financial system. You know, your, your, your high street independent financial advisor, for instance, this, this, this kind of entity within the United Kingdom. Okay, so looking at the diagram there, you can see that we've got different regulators responsible for different people. They all work in different ways. All, all of this was created under the Financial Services Act of 2012, which which overhauled and, and reformed various aspects of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, FISMA 2000, which I've no doubt you've probably heard of. Now these two regulators are told by the law, by government, by parliament, that they are there to cooperate with one another. They're supposed to talk to one another and, and, and try and cooperate and coordinate the actions that they take. Therefore, in theory at least, there shouldn't ever be a situation in which one regulator takes a decision that the other regulator disagrees with. However, it's possible, isn't it? It's possible that when the FCA is carrying out its prudential regulation role with these single regulated firms, it's possible that they might take a decision that the PRA disagrees with. If that ever were to happen, then the PRA, in theory at least, has the right to veto such a prudential regulation decision which the FCA has taken. Okay, so that right of veto does exist, so fingers crossed we would never actually have to use the thing or bring it into place. Is that all okay? Any, any, any questions about that so far? Okay, so I've mentioned this thing called the Financial Services Act of 2012, and I said that the Financial Services Act 2012 imposed various statutory objectives which the Financial Conduct Authority is supposed to achieve. Okay, so so these statutory objectives are enshrined in law. Okay? This, this tells the FCA what to do. There are four statutory objectives which the FCA has to carry out or to meet up with. The first of these is the so-called strategic objective. Strategic, of course, means overarching, long-term, in general, all the time, with everything that you're doing. It, and the strategic objective says that the FCA is there to ensure that the relevant markets, that the markets that it regulates, work well. And you might be looking at that thinking, that seems a bit vague. And you'd be absolutely right, that is indeed deliberately and artfully vague. Okay? One of the reasons why the old FSA was criticised by Parliament and by academics as the role that it played in the run-up to and the aftermath of the financial crash that we've just endured. One, one of the reasons they were criticised was for taking far too much of what they called a micro-prudential view of regulation. Micro means nitty-gritty, individual firms, individual processes. They were too busy, in other words, looking into individual firms, individual products, individual employees of those firms and what they were doing, that they lost sight of the macro-prudential view or the macro-prudential regulation that they should have been carried out. Macro means big picture, doesn't it? The FSA lost track or lost sight of the big picture of the UK financial services industry. They failed to recognise the collective systemic risk, system-wide risk, that was building up across the industry as a whole. They basically took their eye off the ball. So this strategic objective is drafted in such a way as to try and avoid that ever happening again. 
by not being specific, it gives the FCA a very wide remit. It makes it easy for the FCA to do its job properly in terms of looking at the big picture, in terms of deciding for itself where risks are building up and where those risks need to be addressed. But obviously, it's a bit too vague to kind of tell the FSA, uh, FCA sorry, what it should be doing on a day-by-day -day basis. So, so this strategy, strategic objective is supplemented by three operational objectives. Operational means day-by-day. -day. It means on an individual basis. It means with individual firms, with individual products, individual clients, and so on and so forth. The first of these operational objectives is the, the one that we were describing about 15 minutes or so ago. This was the objective telling the FCA that it is there to protect consumers, okay? So give consumers an adequate level of protection. But the objective tells the FCA that different consumers need different amounts of protection. It's not in anybody's interest for all consumers to be given total protection all of the time. Some consumers need full protection. Those consumers with very little knowledge or very little experience of dealing with financial products or, or with interacting with financial services firms, it's in their interest to be given full comprehensive protection. But other consumers don't. Some consumers are more knowledgeable, more experienced, more able to look after themselves, in other words. And it's not in those consumers' interest to be given full protection because protection means cost. Protection means delay. Protection means various riskier yet higher yielding products are off the table for people being given that protection. Do you see what I mean? Those consumers wouldn't be able to have those products fit a suitability assessment or, or criteria. So for those consumers that don't need protection, the FCA don't give them it. And it's in their interest not to have that protection. So that all kind of makes sense, it all, all line up. Yeah? Okay, so protect consumers. Okay. Secondly, the FCA is there to protect and preserve and enhance the integrity of the UK financial services industry. Integrity has several different meanings. If you think about the word integrity, one meaning of the word integrity is to do with completeness, okay? integral in that way, in other words. So they're there to make sure that the UK financial services industry is complete in the sense of works together. Right? Make sure that all firms work together for mutual benefit for consumer outcomes. Make sure that regulators and firms cooperate so that the financial service industry is better preserved. Okay? But secondly, integrity means ethics, doesn't it? It means values. It means wanting to do the right thing. Okay? And, and the objective captures both meanings. So in terms of integrity here, the FCA is there to make sure that firms act with integrity. That firms put their customers or clients first that firms look for situations in which the firm's interests conflict with the client's interest and make sure that client's interests are not damaged or, or harmed or affected in some way as a result of such a conflict of interest. Integrity also refers to financial crime. Okay, the FCA takes the lead in terms of combating financial crime within the UK financial services industry. It would be naive and unrealistic to expect financial crime ever to be eliminated but the FCA is there to try and contribute to a reduction in financial crime, to, to minimise levels of financial crime in as much as it is possible. Thirdly, the FCA is there to promote competition. Okay, we live in a capitalist society. When firms compete on a fair basis, that's good for the economy. It drives down costs and it drives up quality standards. So. The FCA is there to try and enhance and protect competition between firms for customer benefit. A great example of this is the way in which certain retail banks are being forced to hive off parts of their operations so as to try and break what the government sees as the uh, cartel or the, 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 the overbearing control that a small number of retail banks have over the retail banking industry. And we saw that happen last month when TSB, for instance, was hived off by Lloyds Bank and was listed on the exchange. Okay, so, so there you can see the three operational objectives which the FCA has to carry out and put into place. All make sense? Brilliant, okay, so general powers of the FCA. What can the FCA do? Okay, so these powers are granted to the FCA by the Financial Service Markets Act of 2000. 
firstly, the FCA is there to grant, vary or withdraw authorised person status to firms. If you want to be a stockbroker, if you want to be a fund manager, if you want to be an IFA, you can't just do it. If you just do it, then you're breaking the law, you're breaking section 19 of FISMA 2000, the general prohibition. You've got to get permission to carry out those roles from the FCA and or the PRA. Okay? So the FCA governs that regime. And this permission is specific to particular roles or tasks. If you break the rules, then the FCA could take away your permission, they could vary your permission, they might make you downscale your operations, for instance, or they might say that you can only serve professional clients, not retail clients, this sort of thing. But the FCA also operates something called the approved persons regime. This is for individual members of staff of authorised firms. If you want to carry out what are called controlled function roles within an authorised firm, you have to have permission from the FCA, again, and or the PRA, to carry out that particular job role. This involves roles such as governing functions, like if you're a director, for instance, or a partner in an authorised firm. It also includes required functions. These are functions which are required by law or by FCA regulations, such as having a money laundering reporting officer, for example, such as having a head of a compliance department that looks into compliance across the firm. Thirdly, we have systems and control-based rules and, and, and roles within the firm. This could involve head of internal audit, for instance, head of the accounts team, which guarantees financial reporting is accurate throughout the firm. We also have customer-facing roles, too. If you come into face-to-face -face contact with retail clients, then you need, if you're giving them advice, then you need to have permission from the FCA to do that job. So the FCA grants and, again, withdraws this permission if you break the rules. Secondly, the FCA is able to make rules for the people listed in this box, firms and individuals. They can create conduct of business rules, they can create um, training and competency rules, for instance, telling you which exams you have to take and how your firm assesses your competence in those various different roles. The FCA can also prosecute for various types of financial crime. Usually, when a person is accused of carrying out a crime, they would be prosecuted by the uh, Crown Prosecution Service. Okay, which, which will generally prosecute people, not for certain types of financial crime. If you take inside the dealing, for example, it's not the Crown Prosecution Service that would prosecute you in the courts, it's the FCA itself that would lead that prosecution. Because financial crime tends to be a lot more complex, a lot more esoteric than usual crime or non-financial crime. Therefore, we'd like to have experts leading the case in the courts for the prosecution to make sure justice is done. And they supervise, they enforce their rules, they come up with various sanctions, punishments, disciplinary action, etc., for people who choose to break those rules. So in general terms, this is what the FCA spends its time doing. All right. Now, broadly speaking, there are two broad ways in which regulations work and operate. There's rule-based approaches to regulation, and there is principles-based approaches to regulation. A rule-based approach is where the regulator defines detailed rules that you have to comply with to the letter. A good example of this is the conduct of business rules. To give you an example, if you market products at a distance, then the conduct of business rules say that you have to give a cooling off period of 14 calendar days to allow the customer to decide whether or not they would like to cancel. That is a rule. There's no, there's no wriggle room there. You can't interpret that in any other way. You've got to give them 14 day cooling off period. By contrast, the second way in which regulators often work is called the principles-based approach to regulation. Rather than defining strict rules, here the FCA spells out broad overarching principles that it expects firms and individuals to comply with. A great example of this are the 11 principles for businesses, which are being beamed onto the screen behind me right now. With a principles-based approach, the FCA says to firms or individuals, OK, these are the principles, here you go, we expect you, the firm, to read through these principles, to think about what they mean for you as a firm, for your staff, for your products, for your marketplace, and we expect you to put them into action. OK? <laughs> the firm can't just choose not to follow the principles, the firm has to gather evidence and show the FCA that they are following the principles. But the difference is the FCA is not dictating to the firm exactly how they must follow the principles. 
This is because firm A and firm B might both be following the principles very well, but doing completely different things in order to do so. Following the principles as an investment bank, for instance, might be very different to following the principles as an independent financial advisor. So, some group work. What I would like you to do is, in your groups, I'm going to give you a couple of the principles each, okay? a different set of principles for each of the groups. I'm deliberately not telling you what the principles are. I want you to read through the couple of principles that I give you, and I'd like you to come up with some examples of how you think your firm implements those principles. Either the firm you work for now, or if you prefer, a firm you've worked for in the past. Not a problem whatsoever. I'm looking for concrete, real-life examples of how firms put these principles into place. OK, everyone, let's take a look at what you've come up with. OK, so taking a look at the principles for businesses. If we start with principle number one, integrity. Um, can you guys give me an example of what you think is meant by integrity in this context? OK, so part of it's to do with recruitment processes, you're right. Integrity in an ethical sense, we need to consider the sorts of people to whom we're offering jobs and thinking about whether or not they have personal integrity. Okay, and the firm needs to have systems in place to try and control or, or monitor the, the integrity that their staff are showing. Excellent. That, that's, yeah, that's one way it's interpreted. Yeah. Anything else? So in, in terms of as a company doing the right thing by our customers, that, that's exactly what integrity is about. Um, integrity, as, as an individual, integrity is about your personal values. It's about the, the desire or the willingness to always do the right thing, regardless of whether you're following rules or not, regardless of whether you're being watched or not. Okay? Do you do the right thing because you're following the rules? Do you do the right thing because your boss is watching you? Or do you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do? And personally speaking, I always do the right thing to do, and that's me as a person. Similar with firms. The firms do the right thing by their customers because they fear the FCA punishing them if they don't. Or do firms do the right thing by their customers because it's the right thing to do? And as firms, we're good, upstanding you know, members of society too. We have a role to play in society and we ought to contribute to the benefits of society in the way we operate. Do you see the subtle difference there? Good. So that's, that, that's, integrity. That, that's integrity in a nutshell. It's very good. OK, this group in the back, principle three, management and control. What did you come up with for that? Excellent. You've got it. It's to do with directors, senior managers, corporate governance rules, making sure they know what they're doing, that they're qualified, OK, that they've got appropriate qualifications to be on the board, that they challenge one another, particularly non-executive directors. They should have the information and the confidence and the ability to challenge the decisions being taken by executive directors. That's to the benefit of shareholders and the firm, it's to the, the, to the benefit of the firm keeping the executives on their toes, to the benefit of society more generally. You're absolutely right. These management and control rules came about largely as a result of the Bering scandal back in the mid-90s. Nick Leeson, rogue trader and so on. Now, Nick Leeson was both a front office trader in the Singapore office of Burns Bank, as well as being the head of the back office team over there. So he cleared his own trades. He was able to hide the trades that he was carrying out against the rules for a, quite a reasonable period of time. So management and control is about, as you say, segregation of duties, making sure that we've got firm policies and procedures in place to make sure that everybody in the firm is supervised in the sense of the, the actions that they're taking being controlled. But what really upset the regulators at the time was the fact that when they came back to London and asked the Bearings Bank directors, well, where were you? Why weren't you watching what Leeson was doing? Why weren't you acting on the information from the Singapore office? It wasn't clear which individual directors were responsible for which individual parts of the firm or the business. There was lots of back uh, book passing going on. Lots of it wasn't my fault going on. And the regulators said, we're not having that anymore. Firms should have clear organisational structures, clear organograms saying which director and manager looks after which part of the firm. That should be recorded. Okay? So you've got it. That's, that's exactly what management and control is about. Firms should be properly managed and controlled in the business activities and decisions that they make. Okay, principle number five, market conduct, was this middle table, I think. You, you had principle five, didn't you? What did you make of principle five? What, what is that? It's about market integrity in that way, protecting the integrity of markets, making sure that markets function efficiently, making sure that we don't take decisions that unfairly bend or distort the market, 
you know, making sure that we don't actually abuse the market to civil offence or inside a deal, having systems in place to control personal account dealing by members of our staff to make sure that they don't enrich themselves using confidential client information, for instance. This all comes under the category of market conduct. It's fair and efficient markets are in everybody's interests. You've got it. That's exactly what it is. Okay, you guys at the back were looking at principle seven, weren't you? That was to do with communications with clients. What, what did you make of that? Outstanding. Yes, so first of all, you were talking about kind of a um, clear, fur, not misleading approach to communicating with our customers. Absolutely, clear means accurate. It means using valid benchmarks, it means using up-to-date information. Fur means unbiased. So we're not trying to present some kind of unfair spin on the information that we put to our clients. Not misleading means exactly that. You don't deliberately go out to mislead your clients by having lots of small print or lots of obscure legalistic language in the promotions that you give or the letters that you send to people that you consider the average member of your target audience when you're marketing and you, and you pitch your communications appropriately to that person. That's right. But then you went on to say, it's not just about what it is that you put in your communications, it's also about trying to encourage a two-way dialogue with your clients, communicating with them on a regular basis, making sure that you keep them informed, keep them abreast of the situation and the market and the, 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 the funds and the assets that you're holding onto on their behalf. Absolutely, so you're proactive in that manner. Excellent, thank you very much. And principle number nine, customer's relationship of trust. It was this table over here, wasn't it? What, what does that mean? It's about trying to make a bond of trust with your customers, you've got it. So for instance, recommending suitable products to your clients. If they trust you, they're more likely to be open and honest with you. So they would give you more information, which is relevant to helping you decide what risk category to put them into, what kind of products to market to them to make sure that those products are suitable to meet their needs. Absolutely right. But what it's also about is that customers should be entitled to trust the information or advice or recommendations being given to them by the firm. Yeah, we're not, we're not used car salesmen, you know, where when you drive the car off the lot, if the exhaust falls off, that's your fault, you know. Caveat emptor and all of this, buyer beware, the goods are sold as seen. None of that nonsense, okay. If customers listen to us and act on our recommendations, yeah, they should be entitled to trust that. There should be something in it for us too. Okay? If the advice goes wrong, we don't just turn around and say, well, you shouldn't have listened to us in the first place, as some firms have tried to do in the past. Okay? So we're not used car salesmen. Okay, going back to principle two, skill, care and diligence. What did you make of that one? You've got it. Skill, care and diligence is all about doing your job properly. On a firm-wide basis, it means doing our best for our clients to give them a good quality service. For instance, we don't take on more work than we've got the resources to handle. If you do that, then you end up cutting corners and you do a shoddy job for your clients, right? Because you're just chasing more fees. You only take on as much work as you've got the capacity to deliver. But again, on an individual basis, it means making sure that staff are trained and that they're only asked to do jobs that they're competent at carrying out. It means that we assess the competence of staff on a regular basis to check that they remain up to speed and up to date. Excellent, you've, you've, you've got it, that's due skill, care and diligence. Principle four, financial prudence. What, what might that mean, do you think? It's about staying stable as a firm, staying financially safe, staying solvent. It's about being fully aware of your liquidity risk as a firm, understanding what your liabilities are when they fall due for payment, understanding your cash position and understanding what assets you can convert quickly into cash to make sure that you remain stable as a firm. It's absolutely right. It's tempting to reduce your capital base because the lower your capital base is, the more assets you can create and the more profitable you can be. But, but there should be a limit to which you can't go past. I mean, look at Lord and Rock, for instance. They were selling people mortgages on 25-year basis, largely financed through the short-term money markets. Okay, and they were, they were excessively using that as a source of finance, which was great while the money markets remained open extremely profitable. But as soon as the money markets froze up, the so-called credit crunch, that was it, Northern Rock were finished. Incidentally, bank runs are not caused by banks running out of money. Bank runs are caused by rumour 
of banks running out of money. And there's a subtle difference between the two, isn't there? So financial prudence is also about regularly releasing accurate information to do with the capitalization of banks and other firms into the marketplace so as to avoid rumor, to avoid gossip and doubt spreading and therefore casting doubt on the stability of well-run institutions. Okay, principle six is about customers' interests. What, what did you make of that one? It means putting the customer first. You've got it. Treating your customers fairly. Putting the customer at the center of the corporate culture of the firm. Yeah? Integrating customer needs and wishes into your business strategy. Thinking about how the business as a whole can serve its customers all the time. That's it, yeah. Principle number eight was conflict of interest. So it's about controlling information flows, yeah? As in your example with outside contractors, but also information flows within the firm, perhaps using Chinese walls. So it's to prevent free information flows resulting in conflicts of interest. Where one set of employees is giving advice to a client, another set of employees hears about this advice and is able to take positions, perhaps on behalf of the firm, which kind of exploit that advice. Yeah, that, that's a, a conflict of interest that needs to be managed. There are various firms that have fallen foul of this, that have been accused of not properly acting in accordance with their client's best interest in that way. You, you've got it. Finally, principle 10 relates to client assets. What does, that, what does that mean? It's about looking after client assets properly. Ring fencing client assets from firm assets so that, you know, heaven forbid, if the firm were to go into liquidation, the liquidators don't try and use client assets to pay off the firm's debts. And it's also about making sure that we regularly reconcile clients' assets and client money to our records to check that we are holding what we think we're holding on behalf of our clients, making good any differences. Absolutely right. Again, the FCA expects firms, for instance, to reconcile client money accounts on a daily basis so as to make sure that you've always got a good, clear idea or position of what money you're holding on behalf of your clients in that way. Excellent. Thank you for that. So you can see those 11 principles working out there. Now, just before I leave this slide alone, one of the benefits of principle-based regulation is that it's flexible. It's flexible enough for different firms to interpret in different ways. Okay? Some of the comments we were making there, excellent though they were, they might not be relevant to other types of firm. So different firms can interpret them in different ways. Also, it fails to create loopholes. The problem with rules-based approaches to regulation where you dictate rules that people have to follow is that if something isn't explicitly outlawed by the rules you can get away with it. So if you employ fancy lawyers and people like this to pore over rule books if they identify loopholes you can exploit them. There's no loopholes here you know there's no loopholes to be exploited in that fashion. Okay so that's principles based and the regulators use a balance of the two different forms of regulation in order to achieve their job. The final thing I wanted to take a look at with you today is financial crime and the fight against financial crime within our industry. So money laundering is one of the key ways in which financial crime has tried to be combated. Money laundering literally means to take the proceeds of any criminal action such as, for instance, drug sales, fraud, robbery, tax evasion, um, embezzlement or corruption by politicians or government officials, all this kind of thing. It, money laundering is where you take these proceeds and you make those proceeds appear to be clean, appear to be legitimately earned. Now, if it wasn't possible to launder proceeds of crime, then there'd be no point in carrying out these predicate offences in the first place. What's the point in robbing a bank, for instance, if you know that there's no way you're ever going to be able to spend the cash, if you know there's no way that you're ever going to be able to make the cash appear to be legitimately raised? You'd be a fool to rob a bank in the first place, wouldn't you? So you can see that money laundering is really, really important. If firms can harden themselves as targets against criminals being able to carry out money laundering, then these predicate crimes will be minimised. So. Placements is the first stage of money laundering. This is where the criminal uh, tries or, or attempts to place these criminally generated funds within the banking system. If it's possible to get these into the bank, then you can start manoeuvring them. You can start wiring them abroad, for instance. You can start mixing them with legitimate funds. You can start moving it around, hiding your audit trail. Okay? That process is known as layering. 
Now to the placement stage at which most anti-money laundering controls and processes are implemented by banks and other financial services firms. And the Money Laundering Regulations 2007 spell out in detail exactly what those processes and so on have to be. But if we assume for a second that the criminal is successful in placing their funds into the banking system, they can then start layering, hiding their audit trail, moving money around, intermingling their money with legitimately generated funds. For example, by drawing a check on their bank account and, and paying that money into a fund with a fund manager and starting to trade in stocks and shares and bonds and so on, so as to hide what they're up to. Ultimately, the criminal will then integrate the proceeds of their criminal actions. That means take out these what appear now to be clean funds and intermingle them or integrate them into the legitimate economy, so purchasing businesses, property, etc., which appears to be legitimately sourced. Okay, so that's, that's money laundering in the way in which it operates. Now, the Proceeds of Crime Act is the principal source of legislation which tries to get around this or, or make this an offence. So there are general offences linked to money laundering. First of all, we've got concealing. If you are found guilty of concealing the proceeds of crime, so you rob a bank or you do a drugs deal and you conceal the money raised by doing so, you're looking at up to 14 years imprisonment and or an unlimited fine. And that's on top of the predicate crime that you've carried out. So that's on top of being a drugs dealer or whatever it is that you've done or embezzler in order to raise those funds. It's quite a harsh penalty, isn't it? And quite rightly, okay, that the way that the court system looks at this is that money laundering is akin to receiving stolen goods. Okay? Generally speaking, those who receive stolen goods tend to get harsher penalties than those who carry out the burglary in the first place. Again, you know, if nobody received stolen goods, then it would be pointless burgling houses. So that's, that's the kind of the, the, the rationale behind that. Secondly, you've got arrangements. Arrangements are where you help the money launderer to do their activities, to carry out their functional role. Sometimes criminals target cash-intensive businesses such as restaurants or taxi companies, this, this sort of entity, casinos perhaps, where lots and lots of money, you know, bookmaker shops maybe, lots of money, lots of cash is legitimately being passed around the counter. And they intermingle illegitimately raised funds with that legitimate money in order to try and hide it. Now let's imagine that I'm the, I don't know, the accountant, say, of the company, and I deliberately sign off accounts knowing that it's being used as a money laundering front. I am a, making a, arrangements, I'm, I'm assisting them in that way. I could be looking at 14 years and or, and I'm going to say, fine. The third offence is acquiring and or possessing the proceeds of crime. Okay, so I've robbed the bank, I'm running away from the bank with the money in my bag, and I'm arrested, okay? I could get 14 years simply for having the money in my hand. Okay, in terms of organised crime, you often have the crime lord, the boss, the capo, whatever you want to call that person, with the foot soldiers running around doing criminal actions for them, passing on money, yeah, through the gang, passing on gang funds. Again, so the boss here, even though they're not involved in the predicate crime, they're acquiring proceeds of crime. They could be looking at 14 years as a result. If you knowingly prejudice an investigation into a money laundering offence, you could be looking at five years for doing that particular offence. And then there are offences which only occur within the regulated sector. Okay, so the, these only apply to people working in firms such as you and I. Yeah? Failure to report. You're looking at five years and or an unlimited fine. So if you suspect that one of your clients is a criminal and they're using your firm and its services in order to launder the proceeds of crime, you could get five years if you fail to tell your money laundering officer. Okay? Or if your money laundering officer corruptly takes a backhander from the criminal in order to not make a suspicious activity report to the National Crime Agency, they could get five years for doing so. Then we have tipping off. Tipping off means letting the criminal know that somebody else has made a suspicious activity report about them, therefore enabling the criminal to, to, to run, basically, to escape justice. You're looking at two years and or an unlimited fine for such a tipping off offence. These, these offences were recently reformed a year or two ago, making the penalties slightly different than what they originally were under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. So it's called quite new offences here. Does this all sound familiar? Okay, so money laundering is bad, you know. 
when we were talking about principle for business three, management and control, yeah, that principle says that firms have to put into place systems and processes and procedures to detect and to report money laundering, okay, to, to screen money launderers, to see whether or not we can identify them and therefore bring them to justice in the activities that they're carrying out. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about then was criminal and civil offences. Okay, one of the, the key things which, certainly when I'm teaching regulations, which you need to get straight, is the difference between these two types of offence. So to kind of broadly tell you the difference between these two types of offence, I've brought in two bits of legislation that the FCA controls or enforces. First of all, we've got insider dealing laws and legislation, and then we'll compare that to the related offence of market abuse. So insider dealing is an example of a criminal offence. It's criminalised under something called the Criminal Justice Act of 1993. Part 5 of that Act creates three offences of insider dealing. Dealing on inside information, yeah, passing on inside information, encouraging others to deal on inside information. So they're all criminal offences. Right? Criminal offences are heard in the Crown Court. Well, first of all, magistrates decide that they can't deal with the offence, generally speaking, financial crime, and they pass that on to the Crown Court. So we've got a judge, jury, defence lawyer, prosecuting lawyer, etc. Of course, the prosecuting barristers and lawyers will be FCA controlled. Right? And the point of any criminal offence is that the prosecutors have to prove intent yeah, in the mind of the accused. That means that they have to know that they are breaking the law and know that the actions that they are taking are illegal at the point in time at which they are carrying out those offences. So if you're accused of insider dealing, the FCA has to prove that you knew that you were acting in an illegal way and that you chose to act in an illegal fashion despite the fact that you knew that you were breaking the law. Right? That's, that's what intent is all about. And there's a very high burden of proof to this. The burden of proof is beyond all reasonable doubt. That doesn't mean beyond any doubt. If it was beyond any doubt, no one would ever get convicted of any crime ever. You know? It's beyond all reasonable doubt that the jurors might have in the case which is involved. That makes sense? Now, for criminal offences, you can go to jail if you break the law in that way. For insider dealing, the maximum penalty is seven years imprisonment and or an unlimited fine for carrying out that offence. Now, this all sounds well and good, but there's a problem. Okay, and the problem is the way in which the court systems work and operate. You remember, you've got 12 average members of the public who make up the jury. Okay, compared to non-financial crimes, financial crimes tend to be rather complex, difficult to understand. Yeah, lots of evidence, lots of shades of grey, lots of terminology. Which your average man or lady in the street, I don't mean this street, yeah, this is the city of London, I mean streets out there in the rest of the UK, generally wouldn't understand. So if you're the defence lawyer, this is man of heaven, you know? All you've got to do is confuse the jury, therefore creating reasonable doubt, bang, your client can be as guilty as sin and yet they're off the hook, okay? So there's a problem with the way in which this is enforced. Back in the 90s, insider dealing was pretty rife in the city, going on all the time, and yet it was very difficult for the law enforcement agencies to get satisfaction, <laughs> because on the rare occasions when they bothered prosecuting people, the case just got thrown out. You know, they were found not guilty all the time, or the, the case would collapse because the jurors simply didn't understand what was going on. So to use that old expression, the law was an ass. Okay? It didn't really help us in terms of enforcing market their yeah, integrity and legitimacy in the UK. So along came market abuse legislation. Back in 2000, the government at the time was overhauling and reforming the financial services industry and the way it was regulated. And they took the opportunity with FISMA 2000, section 118 of FISMA 2000, to create a new civil offence known as market abuse. And market abuse captures activities which are similar to insider dealing. If I insider deal, I am both insider dealing and I am abusing the market. If I pass on inside information to somebody else, I am both insider dealing and I am abusing the market. Okay? But the key to this is that this is a civil offence, therefore it doesn't go anywhere near the Crown Court. There is no judge, okay? there is no jury, 12 members of the public, who can be confused in this way, who doesn't understand what's going on. Instead, we have something called the Regulatory Decisions Committee of the Financial Conduct Authority. 
And these guys are experts. Yeah? They know what they're doing. It's therefore very difficult to confuse them, to pull the wool over their eyes. Right? What makes this even better is that this is an effect-based offence. Effect. Effect means that the people judging your innocence or guilt will simply look at your behaviour, at the actions that you took. And if the actions that you took happen to abuse the market, then market abuse is proven. What goes on in your mind, your intent, is entirely irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether you knew you were abusing the market or not. It doesn't matter whether you chose to abuse the market or not. All that matters is that the actions you carried out happen to be abusive. And in doing so, market abuse is proven. And what's even better still is that there's none of this beyond all reasonable doubt. This is just balance of probabilities. We've just got to be 51% sure that the behaviour that you carried out happened to be abusive to the market. And in doing so, we've proven the offence. The only downside here is that because this is a civil offence, there is never any jail time on the table. You're looking at an unlimited fine only. However, the fines for market abuse have been growing and growing and growing over the past few years, and now they're very significant. For example, around 18 months ago, a hedge fund manager and the hedge fund itself were both fined for market abuse in a scandal related to the uh, Brewer's Tavern share issue. They, they, they were basically trying to ramp the Brewer's share, Tavern mark share price by placing false orders into sets to do with buying and selling uh, the Brewer's Tavern shares. I don't know if you remember this, but around 18 months ago, the hedge fund manager was personally fined £3.6 million and made bankrupt as a result. And his hedge fund was fined a further £3.6 million for market abuse, which is pretty severe, wouldn't you agree? All right, he didn't go to jail, but, you know, it's enough to bring a tear to the eye, isn't it? It's enough to make people reading the newspapers and hearing about this think twice if they're going to abuse the markets too. So slowly but surely, hopefully, you know, the message is now getting around that insider dealing is, it, you're not just going to get off the case, you know, you can't just employ some lawyer who's going to get you off in the courts. Because you may be thinking, well, well does this still exist inside it? Yes, it does, but it's only the most egregious, the most outrageously obvious cases that the FCA bothers taking to the courts. The cases which are so blind and the obvious that not even a hotshot lawyer can get you off the charge. Okay, nowadays you just go for market abuse. Okay, if I had more time, I'd expand on exactly what's meant by inside the dealing and the different cases and the defences you can use and market abuse, or but we don't. Okay, it's just a little knowledge bite session. But that kind of brings me to the end on the comments that I wanted to make with you. There's a whole load more slides and information in the pack for you to take away, which I'm hoping will kind of flesh out some of the topics that I've introduced to you today. I hope you found today useful or, or interesting. If, if any of you do want to get in touch with me, I've got some of my business cards here. I'm happy to, to hand them out if, if, if you wish to do so. Um, alternatively, you've got your feedback forms. And please, you know, if, if there's any comments or anything else that you want to make, there's you know, plenty of room on the back. If there's any further information that you'd like, if you'd like any of our sales guys to talk to you about courses that we could run for you, again, I'm sure they'd be happy to do that. So with that in mind, let me say thank you for your kind attention and uh, thanks for coming along to today's Knowledge Bite. Thank you. Thank you.